Okay, uh, so I'm actually very happy to go after Marguerite's talk because I'll also be talking about clusters, but uh, from the weak lensing perspective. So uh, I'm Austin Peel. I'm a postdoc at uh, CEA here at Sackley at the, in the uh, Cosmostat group, and I'm going to present some work, um, some new results from a weak lensing um, mass study of the mass distribution of a particular and peculiar merging galaxy cluster system called A520 using a sparsity-based mass mapping technique. And this is work I did with, uh, in collaboration with Francois Lanus, who's uh, a postdoc at Card Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and Jean-Luc Stock, also here in the Cosmostat group. Okay, so I thought I would just jump right in and show you the thing that I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, so this is the, the ABEL 520 cluster. It's a merging cluster system. It's at redshift 0.2. And we're, the, we're seeing it now after the two main cluster, initial cluster components have passed through each other. And so, so uh, what we're looking at in color here is, the, is our mass reconstruction, uh, 2D projected on the sky over the, the black and white uh, star field. And we, we, we computed this mass map, well, I'll explain a bit more later, but using the, the uh, source galaxies in the background of, of this, the lens, which is the, the cluster. And I put a question mark here next to this uh, peak because basically there has been disagreement in the literature about whether or not a dark clump, uh, a dark core has been detected at that position or near that position. And if it's uh, basically a dark, a dark core is a localized uh, anomalously high mass to light ratio region that if it's, if it's real, that would have uh, imp strong implications about our conventional understanding of dark matter as, a, as an effectively collisionless particle. So our motivation uh, was twofold here. We wanted to, uh, we have a new mass mapping algorithm called Glimpse2D, which is based on uh, sparsity. I'll explain that a bit later. And we, it's, we've tested it on simulations. It seems to work quite well, but we wanted to test it on real data. And then the, the second thing was we also wanted to see you know, uh, if we could say something about this disagreement, whether or not there's uh, this dark peak. So I'll first say a few things about why mergers are interesting. Um, we had Marguerite talking just now, so you already have a good idea, I hope. But uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll give you some of the some of the background for A520, um, uh, and try to explain a bit of the history to give you context for why, why it's interesting. Then I'll talk about the, the mass mapping algorithm based on sparsity, and then the results from applying that algorithm to, to the actual A520 data, and then summarize. So mergers are interesting for a number of reasons. Um, basically, they give us uh, an astrophysical laboratory to test uh, to, and to study the properties of dark matter, uh, which is cool. And of course, they can also teach us about galaxy uh, cluster formation and evolution because uh, basically clusters are the most massive gravitationally bound structures in the universe, and they're thought to be built up hierarchically, so mergers are sort of catching them in part of their uh, evolution stage. But maybe just more fundamentally, mergers like this one, this is the, the famous bullet cluster you uh, might be familiar with, uh, but mergers like this have, be, have been seen as direct evidence of the existence of dark matter. And the reason for that is that uh, in the process of merging um, clusters, basically the dark matter halos of the original clusters and the stars essentially pass right through each other. But then the, uh, the intracluster plasma, which is X-ray emitting, gets, uh, undergoes ram pressure in the, in, in the crossing and so it kind of gets stuck in the middle. So uh, yeah, so you get something that ends up like this. So in green here are the contours from the mass map of this uh, bullet cluster reconstruction from, from weak lensing. And then over here in uh, yellow and red, you see the, uh, the X-ray emission, which is offset from the, the peaks in the total mass distribution. So basically the thinking is that if, in, if there's no dark matter and indeed these, these weak lensing maps are coming only from this baryonic matter here, something funny is going on with this offset. Yep. Oh yeah, and uh, cluster or mergers like this have also been used to put constraints 
uh, upper limits on the, the self-interaction cross-section of dark matter particles based on this, uh, the, the offset between the baryons and the dark matter. So that's the bullet cluster. Um, now I'll talk about A520. So here's the mass map by Madavi et al., who first studied this, uh, this merger with weak lensing in 2007. They used a combination of uh, ground-based data from, from CFHT and Subaru. And basically, they were the first to notice that in this kind of in-between here, up, up here is one of the initial clusters, and down here is the other, that somewhere in between, we have this uh, over-dense region that doesn't seem to have the attendant number of galaxy members that you would expect. So it's a very high mass to light ratio uh, region. And they called it a dark clump. Um, and right, so yeah, the contours are the mass. And then in the background, you can see it sort of coincides with the X-ray emission. So some years later, Clo uh, et al. in 2012 uh, looked again at this using now Magellan data, which is um, ground-based, but combined with HST, so Hubble Space Telescope data. So their mass map is now this, the uh, green tealish uh, color, and in the background in purple is the X-ray emission. And so basically they say, yeah, we see some of the same structures that they saw before, but we don't have anything here. There's no, there's no we don't see a dark core. So then in that same year, another group using H HST data, but a, uh, a different instrument on HST, did their own study and said, uh, so this one you kind of have to tilt your head to the left, north is pointing that way now. So you can kind of, yeah, the numbering system is the same, but they say, yeah, should, look, I mean, we do see a dark core here, so that's, um, we, now we confirm the original study. And then in 2014, they updated it with new data from, uh, from HST. And they said, okay, Actually, where we thought we saw one originally, there's not one there anymore, but there's one that's a bit closer to this, uh, you know, pe this, this uh, peak number four, this, the most massive one. It's moved about an arc minute uh, toward that direction, and we, you know, we detect it with high significance. So, yeah, so that was all kind of... Uh, interesting and hopefully you have a, an idea of the strange history of this, of this merger and why we thought it would be interesting to apply a new uh, weak lensing mass mapping algorithm to it. So just as a kind of warm up to get there, to get before I explain the, uh, our mass mapping algorithm, here's just uh, an illustration to show you what's done typically in the field. You start with a galaxy shape catalog that tells you the positions and uh, orientations, sorry, the the, yeah, the shape measurements of all of the galaxies that you're interested in your field. And we treat each ellipticity as a noisy measurement of the true shear field. And then we can just feed it into this uh, Kaiser, Squizer, Kyer, Kaiser and Squires 93 formula, which is basically a, a convolution of, of the, the shear field to give you back the convergence, which is the, the, the mass map that we're after. And so one thing about this is we, it's a convolution in direct space, but it's often just easier to solve in Fourier space. So, but to do that, you're, you know, the galaxies that you observe don't come already nicely on a grid. But if you want to take fast, uh, Fourier transforms, then you need to grid them. So that involves some binning of the data, some smoothing initially to put them on a, on a, in a nice grid. And then, and Kaiser Squire seems to work, oh, I should just say, like these are the, the little sticks are the average ellipticity of galaxies within a region, you know, the size of a pixel. And you can see by eye the correlation between the, the shear pattern and the, 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 the projected mass density. And yeah, and this, this formula seems to work pretty well, uh, except not really near the, near the borders if you have uh, structures near the edges, because we're not actually integrating over all of R2. Uh, you also get problems when you have masks, which are, are definitely uh, a real thing we have to deal with. Uh, yeah, okay. So now I want to talk about Glimpse 2D, which um, was code developed by the, my collaborator, Francois Lanus. It stands for Gravitational Lensing Inversion and Mapping with Sparse Estimators. And the idea is, in contrast to the Kaiser and Squires approach, it's to treat mass mapping as a generic ill-posed inverse problem that we regularize with a multi-scale sparsity prior on the solution. So I'll explain a few, uh, a bit more about what all those words mean. 
But basically, it amounts to solving a, this isn't exactly the equation, but it's of this form. This is a generic kind of optimization problem that uh, uh, is very familiar, for example, in the signal processing field. And uh, so the idea is that we have two terms. The first one is a quadratic term that's uh, essentially data fidelity. The mass map that you reconstruct should look like the data itself, so that makes sense. And we have another term over here that enforces the sparsity of the solution, meaning that transformed into an appropriate basis, the number of coefficients you need to represent that signal is few, as few as possible. So we're looking for the sparsest solution in an appropriate, uh, they call it dictionary, but it's essentially a, a different basis rather than the direct space, just a, a different basis. That's still compatible with the data. So to kind of dive in a bit more to these things, these, the details, in this example, y, y would be our shear data. X is the convergence map we're looking for that minimizes this entire expression. A is some non-invertible operator that takes convergence. It's kind of like the inverse of Kaiser squares. It takes your convergence back to the shear so you can figure out the residual and hope that that's small. Uh, phi is your, your dictionary or, or your, your new basis, your transform. And then lambda here, I'll emphasize that a bit, because lambda is what controls the sparsity of your, your solution. So if you, uh, yeah, well, actually, I'll come back to that in a minute. So OK, here's my one slide uh, basic introduction to sparsity for the non-initiated. The idea is basically having, it has to do with the compressibility of a signal, and that in certain domains, you need lots of coefficients to represent your signal, but by an appropriate choice of basis change, you can, uh, you can reduce that number significantly. This is kind of the canonical example, a stationary sinusoid in direct space, you need lots of coefficients to represent this, os this oscillation. But in Fourier space, you only need one number, plus and minus the frequency of that. So this is similar uh, in spirit to what we're doing for this mass map, or for the mass maps that we're after, except instead of going to Fourier space, we're using something called uh, a starlet transform. And basically, this has nicer properties, like being localized in direct space and in Fourier space. And uh, th so the atoms, or the, the basis functions in 2D, for example, are, like, are isotropic kind of uh, uh, signal that looks more or less like the types of objects we're going to reconstruct in kappa maps, in, in convergence maps, like over densities. So if none of that made any sense, I hope this uh, picture will. Here's a, a nice result from Francois's paper that introduces the glimpse algorithm. So this is a true, this is a, a, a convergence map extracted from an n-body simulation. So consider it the ground truth, where we have some, some clusters at redshift of 0.3. And then in A, it's a simulated galaxy distribution, where you can't really tell, but it's, it's been binned into a map where 93, at such high resolution that 93% of the pixels are actually empty. So applying Kaiser and Squires to that, I mean, we know already that that wouldn't be a good idea. But if you apply it directly to that, this is what comes out. So something that doesn't look anything like the, the original. But you can get something that more or less corresponds if you smooth it by a, a, a wide Gaussian kernel. This is in contrast to solving the equation with a sparse uh, regularization that I was showing before, where straight away you get something that looks much better. So I hope that uh, motivates the, the reason why we want to use this sparse approach to mass mapping. OK, so now moving on to the actual A520 data. We got the catalogs, the lensing catalogs, from the CLO uh, 2012 and the G2014 um, separate studies. And then this is just to kind of show you they came from from some of the same data, but also they use separate data, separate ground-based data. And so the, this is the number count of the galaxy uh, distribution. And you can just see by eye that there are some differences. And this is essentially due to a different reduction pipelines of the two different groups, resulting in a different, uh, different galaxy catalogs. So I mentioned before this lambda parameter is controlling the sparsity of our algorithm. And since it's something we have to set by hand initially when we run, when we, uh, run this algorithm. So to kind of calibrate our expectations, we did some simple, simple simulations where I took the A520 field and just stuck an NFW profile 
into it at the position of one of those uh, main clusters, uh, main subclusters. And so this is, these are the results uh, for using the true shear as the signal. Okay, so no surprise, glimpse for any level of our sparsity can recover the signal in the noiseless case. That's not, not too surprising. And then I added noise, uh, shape noise to all of the galaxies that resembles what we really see in the A520 data. And so now the difference is, it becomes clear. We really only have something here, but because of noise, when we have uh, at a low level of lambda, or in other words, we're uh, a weak enforcing of the sparsity constraint, we get all these other noise peaks popping up. But when we raise it the level up to three, they all disappear and we essentially get what we put in. And then we don't get anything better by raising it higher. And so uh, I think um, I'll just skip this actually. So, okay. Now this is an actual, the actual result for lambda equals two of running glimpse on the CLO 2012 data. And so we see, I, I used the same numbering system that they used in their papers. And so we, we essentially see P1, 2, and 4, the same kind of structures that they saw in the same places, so that's good. 3 was the original place of the dark peak, and then P3 prime is where it moved to. And in neither of those places do we really see any structure, neither did they, so um, you know things are looking good. So that's at a low level of lambda. As we raise it to, to 3, we only get the most significant stuff coming out, and then same for 4. So here's just all three of them for the various uh, lambda levels compared with their original, and we see good agreement. In other words, we don't see the dark, we don't detect the dark peak just like they didn't. And then on the J14 data, um, same thing here. I'll just run through them quickly. This is for lambda equals two, three. Again, we're suppressing the noise as we raise lambda. So we only are left with these, uh, the most significant peaks, and then maybe a hint of something here, but it's hard to tell. And then by lambda equals four, it's only the, the primary two clusters, subclusters. So, and then this is for comparison with the, their original. So more, okay. so more or less uh, good agreement overall, but we have some intriguing hints in the J14 data where they said, yes, we strongly detect this dark core. We see it at lambda equals two, but we know that when lambda is so low, we're susceptible to getting all sorts of other noise peaks. So to try to clarify the issue, we wanted to, add, we wanted to answer the question, how significant is that that uh, dark peak potentially that we, that we might be seeing. And so to do that, we ran glimpse on a large number of noise simulations of the data, where basically we took the original catalog and then shuffled the galaxies around, gave them a random spin. And then, and then in each of those uh, maps, looked at the number, uh, the amplitude and the number of peaks arising. And so, uh, so basically, in, um, that tells us, for a given lambda value, how many noise peaks we expect at a given amplitude. And then we can compare that with the statistics of those from those noise maps to what we see in the real data. So this is the, the original reconstruction for lambda equals three. And now I've ordered the peaks by amplitude, basically. And so by comparing how many peaks we would expect purely from noise to uh, in amplitude to what we actually see, we can assign a significance value to them. And then as we continue to raise the lambda level, we can repeat the process. And then uh, basically, the, the longer that a peak is, is still showing up as we raise lambda, the more significant it is. And so when we do this for the J14 data, for example, uh, P2 and P4 are at least 3.3 sigma. We're only limited here by the, the number of realizations because we used 1,000. So a 3.3 sigma event is a one out, or a, yeah, a one out of 1,000. So if we had more simulations, then we, could, we would certainly push this up higher. But for the, the proposed uh, dark peak here at P3 prime, we find it less than two, two sigma, so we won't count it as a significant detection. So just to sum up, I hope I've convinced you that mergers are interesting, and I've talked about our, real, our weak lensing reanalysis of the A520 merger using a sparsity-based mass mapping technique called GLIMPS. And uh, kind of the takeaway was that with our, by our analysis, we can't confirm the detection of that anomalous dark peak. And in the spirit of uh, presenting reproducible research, you can find the catalogs, the software, and instructions for how to run them and, 
can reproduce our results on the Cosmostat website. Thank you. Um, can can you just go back to the noise? Uh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, can you rem remind how you really did this? So basically, you you play with the noise level, or so you so play with the lambda to see when it's a significant event or not. But I, I don't know how you do this realization of noise. I okay. Yeah. So basically, we 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 wanted to get the same number density of galaxies and have some, you know, the noise properties that more or less represent what we see in the real data. So to do that, we just take all the galaxies that are there and shuffle their positions around within the footprint, within the, the Hubble uh, footprint, and then give them a random orientation but and then do a reconstruction. The, the peaks so that. on the right, this is the, just for comparison, on the right, this is the real, the true reconstruction for lambda equals three. And on the left, it's just the mean of a thousand of them. So you can see like there, there are noise peaks showing up in no, no, you know, preferred place. They're just anywhere. Uh, yeah, that was so. Any and any fluctuations you hear then are just statistical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so again,